Pilots across the galaxy, on with only their microphones, two intrepid warriors are dispatched to the Anaheim system to focus the energy being created by thousands of assembled fans into full, unfilled days of costume, exhibits, screenings, exclusive merchandise reveals, celebrity guests, award ceremonies, tattoo competitions, and other surprises celebrating all things Star Wars. What secrets and mysteries will be revealed? Find out by welcoming our hosts of the Behind the Scenes stage, your source for the force, Jimmy Mack and Jason Scott. phenomenal, phenomenal hour planned for you. And of course, you know the legacy of Star Wars and Del Rey goes back since the original novelization of the first film so many years ago. And it's just, it's just great to see that continuity continue. And so we're going to be talking about what's out there now and what is yet to come. And we've got a fabulous panel for you. So put your hands together first. Delray editor at large, Shelly Shapiro. <laughs> and Lucasfilm senior editor, Jennifer Heddle. author of so many great books, including Star Wars and New Dawn, John Jackson Miller. <laughs> this guy knows the dark side maybe better than just about anybody else. James Lucino. And finally, the great Christy Golden. Well, what did you think of the trailer? It's all right. I loved it. I want to see the movie. I saw it on Lil and She's cell phone, so I'd really like to see it in large. Oh, all right. Waiting in lines, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> on the cell phone. Well, it's amazing. It, it holds up whether you're on a cell phone or you see it on the big screen. It's just uh, phenomenal. You should you check it out. All right. What do you think, Jeff? Loved it. Loved it. Especially the last uh, few seconds when I get to see Han and Chewie. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I think we all felt like we were home at that moment. I thought it was fantastic. It was just one thing after another that just made my heart lift with each new revelation. Yeah, it was, it was something. So let's talk about what's available now. Starting off with uh, John, Star Wars yep. A New Dawn. And it's truly a new dawn for Star Wars in so many ways, but in one profound way, <coughs> Star Wars Rebels. And you had uh, the privilege of introducing <coughs> a lot of new characters to us. Yeah, that was great. That was the uh, the first book that was uh, released in conjunction with the Lucasfilm Story Group. So I got to uh, see what they had planned for Rebels, uh, you know, a good uh, year in advance, uh, and work with Dave Filoni and Simon Kinberg and Greg Wiseman and uh, you know, the other people with the production team at the TV show uh, to come up with a book that uh, showed some things that uh, people would see on screen eventually. And of course with the rest of the Lucasfilm team as well, we worked to make sure that uh, everything connected properly and uh, we showed Kanan and Hera as they were when they met. And what characters were you drawn to immediately? Well, I think Canon is a lot of fun, certainly. Uh, you know, I had written a Kenobi novel, which was about a, you know, a Jedi who... Uh, also available in paperback and ebook uh, and audiobook from Kelly. Uh, yeah, uh, I had written this book about somebody who actually had a plan for the time when, uh, you know, the, the Jedi were in hiding. And uh, he, he knew what he was doing. He had a mission. 
uh, Canaan was like, whoa, uh, what, 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 the border 66, what, everybody's dead. Well, you're just a little kid. <laughs> yeah, a little kid. So basically he decides, okay, well, I guess I'm not a Jedi, I might as well go get drunk. Uh, and, 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 that's, and that's our book. Uh, and, and, it, and, it's, and, that's, and it's the beginning, middle, and end. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun in showing uh, the beginnings of how you know, Canaan, Canaan and Hera uh, start to form this little sort of, you know, it's not even a rebel cell yet, it's almost just more of a family of people who go out and blow things up. And, uh, and uh, that's what they do for fun. You've gotten in the heads of, of so many Jedi uh, in writing these books. Uh, what new did you learn, did you discover in writing Kanan's story? Uh, what new did I discover writing Kanan? Well, again, you know, you, you start thinking about how many of the Jedi's uh, you know, practices are based on the fact that you've got the rules around and the peer pressure of the other Jedi that are out there. And, you know, Kanan uh, has time to think about, well, you know, this whole Jedi dating thing, this is just dumb. Uh, <laughs> he, 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 he doesn't have anybody else out there to, uh, to say no. So, uh, you know, he's He's, he's basically sort of making up his own rules as he's going along. Yeah. And uh, outside of Kanan, who is your favorite character to write in the book? Uh, that book has a, a really interesting character, uh, uh, Ray Sloan, who is the uh, captain of the Ultimatum, and she's uh, just really smart. Uh, and the, the, the fun thing about that character is she is a believer. She's not evil. She just understands that the Republic was a mess in a lot of serious ways. And you know, she, at least at, the, at this early stage uh, of her career, is uh, wanting to you know, play by the rules and uh, try and advance the Emperor's vision for the galaxy, which you know, the, the whole notion of, of the Empire, it's, it can only work if certain people beyond the Emperor believe in it. Uh, they can't all just be mindless slaves, otherwise they would, they would tell them to go away. Uh, but yeah, that, that's uh, she. She, I think, is representative of a new kind of person in in the empire, and uh, and so she was very fun to write. Would you like to go back to uh, the uh, folks on the ghost at some point, revisit them? I think that'd be a lot of fun. Uh, you know, in fact, uh, if folks are interested in Ray Sloan. We have a certain thing out in Star Wars Insider magazine right now, which you can boot. So, uh, new short story. And how was it working with uh, Dave Filoni and and his crew? Oh, uh, well, it's great. We've got a lot of notes back uh, on, on everything. And, uh, you know, I, I said, uh, Kanan's a cowboy, and I said, okay, I need to figure out what, what, what are cows uh, in, in the Star Wars universe? How, how does that work? And then I realized it's an attitude, and, uh, and uh, you know, Kanan is uh, very much, uh, he has many reasons to want to have other people leave him alone uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, to have a, project a certain image. And so, so, yeah, and definitely uh, you've got a lot of help from those guys. I, th I think it's really important to mention that when John was writing this book, um, there was no animation available for Rebels, um, no voiceovers. So, um, you know, that was one reason that the Rebels team was so heavily involved because it wasn't like John could work off of episodes to see how Kanan and Hera moved and talked. And, you know, so we had to make sure that those characters in the book would be true to the characters that you were going to see on the screen very soon. Um, and I think that John just absolutely blew me away with how he managed to nail these characters um, that he hadn't even, you know, been able to see in motion. Um, so I think it just, you know, he and Dave seemed to, when they first started talking about Kanan and who he is, um, they seemed to just get on the same page right away and really connect, and it was just a great process. As a, as a matter of fact, Vanessa Marshall told John in particular that she found the book really helpful in um, learning to, or figuring out how best to voice Hera in the, for the show. That's how well he captured the, the character and the feel of the character, the sound a, of the character. That's a great endorsement. I mean, <laughs> I'm, 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 does he get much better than that? That's right. Study. All right. Well, how about this guy? <laughs> I would say it's about time that he get his own book. And, uh, yeah? And, uh, Jim, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, Tarkin was the forgotten villain. He didn't even get his own action figure for the longest time. And that is, you know, that's the, that was the, the gold standard. That's, that was how you knew whether you had made it. And I guess Karen didn't think we wanted to buy an old gray-haired man, but I wanted him in the worst way. Um, so, his, uh, how has his um, 
his star as a character sort of risen over the years, and how did you capture that in the book? Well, I started with uh, having, um, you know, getting the privilege of writing about the guy who was holding Vader's leash, that foul stench aboard the Death Star. Um, once we had sort of established his background in a colonial world, I was able to create a, a background for, for him that was a little bit different than the other Darksiders. And I, I sort of see him as a Darksider without the dark side of the Force, but uh, faithful to the Empire and willing to do whatever it takes to have the Empire succeed. Would you call Tarkin uh, a true believer in that agenda? Or, is he, that. or would you say he's more out for himself? Yeah, beyond that, beyond true believer. Just um, willing to do anything. The Empire, the Empire had to succeed. Uh, we couldn't let chaos uh, reign in the, in the galaxy. And we don't see on screen that much interaction between Vader and Tarkin. We don't have the benefit of seeing how they uh, would have been together had there been you know, more films with them. How did you go about putting those conversations together? Oh, uh, <laughs> pure imagination. Um, uh, in the same way I was able to put uh, Tarkin together with uh, Dooku and put Tarkin together with the uh, Emperor. I don't know where this stuff comes from. You sit down and you start hearing voices in your head and you, <laughs> you either take medication or you get it down on the page. <laughs> I think it's really interesting that you say he's a dark sider of the the dark side of the force. You know, there are, you know, the great villains don't see themselves as villains. Right. So right. Heroes of their own story, as they, it were. Exactly. So um, Tarkin being primeval, is it, did you have to find more to him than that? I, th I think once I had his, once I was able to show the, um, the events that shaped him, uh, it was um, pretty organic about uh, his, the way his character developed and why he was uh, a tool of the Empire. Awesome. Heir to the Jedi. Now, Kevin is not here. I love this puppet. This is just, um, I just love this idea of Luke at this point. Um, Shall we talk about where we find Luke Skywalker here? Uh, this is this is Luke right off, basically right off his experience destroying the Death Star, the first one, and this is a perfect point to study Luke because, and from his point of view, which was very exciting to be able to do, because here he is, a a uh, hero, and it was just like two seconds ago that he was whining about wanting to join the Space Academy, and you know now he's a hero, and he's not sure what happened. He's just learned that he has. To you know, the ability to use the force, but the only person he knows of who could teach him is dead. And he's lost almost everything. He's got new friends, new family, kind of, but he's lost his aunt and uncle, he lost Obi-Wan, and he's kind of floundering. He's absolutely with the Rebel Alliance, but he has to figure his way through to figure out who he is. You know, is he, is he the arrogant hero? Is he the humble uh, Padawan? Or, Want to be Padawan? Is he? You know what? Who is he? And it's a great, great place to explore him. And like I said, perfect place to get into his head from the first person. And how do you go about matching these projects? Very daunting projects, especially in this time where there's so much free reign in in, in the storytelling. How do you go about matching them with the right author? Well, in this case, uh, you know, I was always on the lookout for authors who might want to write Star Wars. And in this case, I'm a fan of Kevin's Iron Druid books. And I've noticed that he makes Star Wars references in his books all the time. So clearly he's an enormous fan. <laughs> so we decided, we, this, it seemed, I thought in some ways his character Atticus, while on the, other, on the one hand he's thousands of years old, even though he seems 21, um, had some similarities in, with Luke's character. And it just seemed like a good one to approach him for, to see if he wanted to write a Star Wars book and if he wanted to write a Luke book. And so, though it is in Luke's uh, perspective, tell us about what the other characters are thinking and doing at this point. We have to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, most, mostly it's Luke doing his, Luke's his thing. It's really Luke's story. All right, well, that was what's available now. So let's turn the page here and let's talk about 
and some of the things that are coming up, starting with... Lords of the Sith, and I think when we saw this cover, we all just, and it was just such a dream come true to see these two in battle together. And something we know about Palpatine is with very, very few exceptions, he never gets his hands dirty. But it looks here, based on the cover, he's about to get his hands dirty. Yeah, I mean, this, um, this super high concept for this novel was Let's have a book where Vader and the Emperor just kick some ass. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was, you know, like you just said, we just thought it would be really fun to see the two of them in action together. And, um, you know, they're, they're put into a situation where the Emperor, he kind of has to get his hands a little dirty. Um, they don't really have, uh, you know, uh, much other resources to rely on. Um, and, uh, you know, I should also mention that um, one of the other main characters in this book, it's, it's basically um, takes place above and on Ryloth. And um, it deals a lot with the freedom movement on that planet, which is being led by Cham Syndulla, um, who is Hera's father uh, from Rebels. So it's, um, he's a great character as well, and so it's really great to see um, these opposing views, and also to get to see what, how those characters see Vader. Um, you know, basically he scares the crap out of them, as he should. <laughs> um, and so it's really interesting to see how they try to, it, it, it's that thing where they know they have to take him out, but they're really scared to do it because he's so powerful. Well, they don't, they don't even really know all his powers that right. we know from the movies, because exactly. they haven't seen the movies. So <laughs> all, all they know is that this guy is really scary and he does scary things, but they don't have a clue about the force really, and they don't they don't they only have a sense of a fraction of what he can do, and they're really scared. Mm -hmm. And it, we see this so clearly; it brings it all to life in a really nice, scary Vader way. Yeah. Now, no spoilers, of course, but might we be better informed as to how? Hera's views of the Empire and what motivates her and her struggles that they might be informed by what we see in this book? Um, yes, I think you'll... Um, the long yes. You'll, <laughs> the long answer is yes. Um, no, I think you will get um, a better sense of why Hera approaches the rebellion the way she does um, based on how her father approached things. It's, it is going to be um, an interesting uh, relationship to see there. And do we see Kara in the book? You have to read the book. Look at everything. All right. You gotta do some work yourself now. <laughs> <laughs> Unproduced episodes of Survive the Clone again. Wars. This was uh, something that I think the fans have been asking for for a long time. Maybe demanding, <laughs> in some ways. Demanding to see because of all the great groundwork that was laid in the series. Um, how difficult was it to decide to grab these stories and give them new life into book form? Oh, it wasn't difficult at all. Um, <laughs> in fact, the funny thing is that um, the way this came about is we were talking to Dave and the story group about something else, something completely different. Um, and anyone who's ever uh, listened to Dave speak knows that he you know, can occasionally go off on tangents. Uh, and he went off on this tangent about this um, Ventress and Quinlan Voss arc um, that was written but never, you know, aired, and we kind of said, whoa, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, this, this other idea we're talking about is good, but tell us more about this, you know, this, this could be an amazing book. Um, so it was, it was a really easy decision. We were so, so excited to be able to do it. We're so happy that Dave, you know, gave us the okay to do it. Um, we've, we've been wanting to do something with Ventress, especially for a while, so this was the perfect opportunity. Now, Christy, you had sort of the opposite scenario as, as John, where John was sort of prepping something that we were about to see, whereas you're taking something that we were going to see, maybe, but 
did get to see and fill that out. Well, we did get to see quite a bit of Asajj Ventress in the Clone Wars. And so there was all that information for me to draw on. And those, of course, were fully realized episodes. I also was able to get all eight of the scripts and four animatics. So I was able to see how the characters could interact. And those of you who were at the, um, the panel where they showed some of these things, you can see how even when they're not completed, there's still so much there. So that was very, very helpful. And my job was to familiarize myself with that world and these two characters to the point where um, and James has nailed it. You hear the voices in your head and they start speaking. And uh, my hope is that when people read this, they will not be able to tell which came from the script and which came from me. And if that's the case, then I will have done my job right. Excellent. Excellent. Um. <laughs> How about that cover, right? <laughs> we are on a journey indeed. And the journey to the Force Awakens. And this is this is really a cross-platform, cross-publisher uh, effort. Um, which, as Star Wars fans, we, we've seen similar things like this. Um, how is Journey to Star Wars The Force Awakens, how is that different from, say, the campaign for Shadows of the Empire, for example, where it was cross-platform? Um, well, I think the big difference is that now we have the Lucasfilm Story Group, um, who, um, what's great for someone like me, who's dealing with different publishers on different projects, um, is that, you know, we have this group of amazing people that we can go to, um, who are really taking this high-level macro view of everything that's going on, um, and can suggest ways that these different projects uh, on different platforms from, you know, different publishers can tie together. Um, I wasn't around for Shadows of the Empire. I mean, here, I was alive, but <laughs> I wasn't at Lucasfilm then. Was it that uh, long ago? <laughs> um, but yeah, this has been a really fun venture to work on. It's um, the journey to the Force Awakens program uh, is being published across age levels, um, prose, comics, um, and again, the luxury of the story group is that we can have all of these different talented authors telling the stories that they want to tell, and then we kind of have the story group who's reading everything, saying, oh, here are the ways that we can you know, start to tie these threads together. And do you know at this point how many pieces of literature will be telling this story at this point, or is that still evolving? Um, well, I believe the official number is 20, but um, quite a few of those are like sticker and coloring books, so there's not a lot of story in those. Um, but there's at least um, six or seven um, important pieces of fiction that will tie together a little bit, and, and ha all, they'll all have um, little clues and Easter eggs uh, related <coughs> to The Force Awakens. And they will all have the banner. They'll all have the banner, yes. Okay. So and these will all be released, I'm assuming, then by the end of the year? By the They'll time? all be released on September 4th this year. Everything released at once? That's the idea. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do on September 4th? <laughs> <laughs> so with a, with a film as secret as, clearly, um, The Force Awakens, how do you spread out all this information that is required and still sort of keep some of the best, they still, he's laughing. <laughs> how do you do it? How do you keep it all secret, but yet have them, you know, working on these, on these projects? Is it they all know, like, little pieces, but nobody knows everything? Is that how it works? Kind of. It's just really yeah. handled very, very carefully. Yeah. <laughs> it's very, it's very neat to know. Um, you know, like I said, the, the real um, Force Awakens components are, you know, they're, they're oblique at this point. Um, there are a lot of things that you're not, you're not even going to realize what the connection is until you actually see the movie. It's like, oh, that's, you know. So, yeah. so the movie is the payoff in some ways, as opposed to. Yeah. Right. right. But you don't, and again, you know, because of that, because everything's coming out <laughs> in September, you, you don't need to know anything about The Force Awakens. I mean, these are, you know, complete stories that stand on their own. You know, this is more just, you know, this was what we could do, 
in September 2015 <laughs> to give fans, you know, little tastes um, of what they might be able to see in December while still just telling, you know, great stories. Well, the authors are all being held on a secret site until December. You know, they, release, <laughs> they release one movie. <laughs> well, we have to have something to pass the time because, boy, that time September rolls around. It's just going to be like the worst Christmas Eve, the longest Christmas Eve ever. <laughs> um, now we have um, two books that are going to be packaged together. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're 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 bringing these two stories together, these two novels together into one bind up, and we're calling it Rise of the Empire. We're trying to sort of do is show a the thread that ties things from the start of the empire through as it became powerful and you know right before the you know rebel alliance destroys it or hopefully destroys it um or at least until they destroy two death stars um we are going to have three new brand new short stories to go along to kind of, to kind of connect these um or fill some spaces between them and one of those will actually uh, nod toward um, aftermath, so that we can feel that this is all one, we're, uh, one galaxy and one history, and that the, the, the journey that we all started when the emperor took over and just, you know destroyed freedom, till that moment of initial like total feeling of victory at the end of Return of the Jedi. There's one long, uh, tied together journey um, of, of the galaxy in general. So that's the goal, goal for this, this bind up, to give that feeling of it all being together. And also, we haven't had a chance before this much to explore the dark times, the times between the, the, the earlier movies. And this also gave us that opportunity to start doing a little bit more. This just, this bringing these together just shows that we're solidly in that era now, that we can explore it, and adding the stories is just making it, um, giving it some more meat, and making it more feel like it's all one tale. Yeah, I think it's a great idea if you, you, know, you look at the covers, and you know, one is, uh, if you're following Rebels, you realize that that's an animated series, where the other is a little bit more movie realistic, and so combining them, I think, is a, is a fantastic idea to get that sense of kind. Well, it also reminds people that it doesn't matter. It's animated, it's on TV, it's right. Right. movies, it's real people, but it's all acting, it's all stories, it's all, it's all real media. Yeah. All one universe, as uh, Leland Chi said in the, in the last panel. Battlefront. Yeah. yeah! Cover not final, not out for yeah, November yeah. 3rd. Probably not a whole lot you can say about this, but... Uh, That's the subtitle, Cover Not Final. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one. I can't wait to page turn. Um, well, tell us what uh, what you can about that, if you would, please. Well, speaking of all one media, I mean, you know, it's all... That's kind of media as plural. But anyway, um, this is connected to the Battlefront game that now everybody knows about. And it's just, it's, it's not a novelization, that's not that kind of game, and we didn't want to try to do that. But it is, it should give you, if you, if you are a gamer, it should give you a taste of being in the game as a gamer. And if you're not a gamer, it should just give you a great taste of what it was, would be like to be a soldier on the front lines in the Rebel Alliance. Yeah, so, I mean, sorry, I'm just going to say, you know, this again is another case where um, you know, having the story group and really focusing on one big story, one continuity really comes in handy. Um, you know, they're able to facilitate uh, between publishing and, you know, EA. Um, again, you know, we know, we know what Battlefront, the video game is. It's a kick-ass action game. Um, and so, you know, what we're able to do is just kind of focus in on a story about the Twilight Company, um, you know, a particular uh, platoon of people, but it, it, it'll basically, you know, you'll get the sense when you're playing the game of what it's like, but this will put you more in, in the heads of, you know, particular rebels fighting that fight. Is it more of sort of the everyday soldier? Exactly. Yes. As exactly. opposed to the yeah. heroes. <laughs> 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 so at this point, 
Oh, that's right. Yeah, we have, a, we have this awesome sampler, which you can pick up at our booth, that has sample chapters from all of these, except for After Yeah, and we should mention that um, the author, Alex Reed, he's um, worked in the video game arena before. I'm not mistaken on that front, but... Um, and he's a writer. He's written um, some short stories for us in the past in Insider. This is his first novel for us, and... It's really good. He's done an amazing job. He's a really great writer. Um, yeah, I think you guys are going to love it. So at this point, we're going to open it up for questions. So if you have a question, get the hands up, keep them up. Know, get some, the arms get a little tired. Uh, but uh, my buddy Pete down here is going to find you. And uh, I'll ask you what your question is. So we have, do we have one? Yeah, where's the, right here in the corner, sir, do you have a question? I understand you're looking for someone to write the novelization of The Force Awakens. I'd be happy to do that. <laughs> um, sure there are a lot of people here that would like to do that. Yeah, I mean, I, everybody hold up your hand if you'd like to write the novelization. <laughs> so, uh, so why, I can't even see you from here, we can't see anybody actually. So why, what makes you qualified? Have you, have you written Star Wars before, like when I was a kid or something? It's Alan B. Foster. <laughs> I, I did some a long time ago. Oh. And, uh, I can't believe he's doing it. I think I, I think I know the characters pretty well by now. It would, it would be nice to you know, keep well, working with them. We have to make a decision. We have been looking for someone. It's been taking a while. We're getting down to the wire, you know. What do you think of that? Can you write, can you write fast? Uh, I, can, I can write really fast if it's a good story. <laughs> um, all right. Well, you know, we appreciate your... Uh, okay. changed for you just in terms of you know what you had as resources to draw on from when you wrote the original novelization to now well when I wrote the original novelization I got a copy of the script and a couple of Ralph McQuarrie's pre-production drawings and then I went down to Industrial Light and Magic which was on a, a street called Kester Avenue in Van Nuys and in a rented warehouse and George Lucas showed me around Here's the Death Star, it's the beach ball size thing. I got to watch a handful of people really putting together things like the trench run at the end of the film. The sets, the plastic sets were so big that they had to put them out in the parking lot, so they're shooting Star Wars out in the parking lot. Uh, and uh, killing a little time waiting for George, and this guy says, come here, I want to show you something neat. Look at this camera I've invented. It's John Dykstra showing you his computer controlled camera. <laughs> and they're shooting the green screen shots of the Millennium Falcon, and I'm looking around, and I've never seen so many cannibalized World War II battleship and airplane monuments in my life. So there weren't a lot of people, and there wasn't a lot of stuff. 
but then I got to see some uh, outtakes, not out yeah, uh, outtakes, uh, dailies, excuse me, from the film, and it was TIE fighters shooting at the Millennium Falcon and vice versa with no sound and no music and no sound effects. And I'm looking at this as somebody who grew up with science fiction, and I'm thinking, this, this can't be the whole movie. This is the best part of the movie. I, they can't do this through the whole movie. And I realized when I got the script, if they can put this on screen, this is going to be something really special. And lo and behold. <laughs> <laughs> So that moment when you realized it was going to be special, what was it exactly? Was it the promise of the effects? Was it the characters? Was it the, the whole notion of the force? What was it that really spoke to you at first? I saw it first, for the first time the whole film at a cast and crew screening where they rented a theater on Hollywood Boulevard for people who had worked on the film. And at that point I thought, well, they did it. They put everything on screen that they were going to try to put on screen. But the moment I realized what you just asked, I went to the very first showing of the film at Grauman's Chinese Theater. It was a morning showing, and I sat in the back of the theater and watched the audience. And the film started, and as soon as, as soon as the Star Destroyer comes up on screen, and everybody starts cheering. And I had never seen people cheer for anything in a movie. I mean, stand up and start yelling and cheering in a movie theater, and thought, okay, this is really something special. <laughs> Fantastic. Well. Alan, on behalf of uh, Star Wars fans everywhere, welcome back. Thank you. I guess we made a mistake giving them both the same subtitle. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have to change one of them. Well, I think we can do some, we do have time for some real questions from the audience. Um, please don't be asking if you can write any more novelizations. <laughs> I think this was a one-time thing. <laughs> but uh, so get your hands up and uh, Pete, we have our, our first one. What's your name and where are you from? Kyle from Houston. Kyle, what's your question? Um, I actually have a question for Shelly. So when you have a big multi-book series like you had with you saw long series that involves so many different authors. Do you conceptualize it together as a, uh, just you and Pete Lucas Lucasfilm, or do you get all the authors together and be like, okay, this is the idea we have, this is, and you just kind of kick ideas off each other? Well, each one was a slightly different uh, situation with the New Jedi Order. We were going to have a trillion authors, so we didn't. We started it off with the initial authors and Lucasfilm, and we all discussed it, conceptualized it. Uh, got things approved, got things disapproved, you know, figured things out, and then, then it started growing on its own. And with the later ones that were just nine books each, that with three authors each, uh, two of which I have, you know, one of which I have sitting right here, um, we did bring the authors in, and we did have everybody brainstorm and plan with uh, Lucasfilm, and I mean, we didn't have a story group back then, but it was. Uh, some of the same people, Pablo and Leland, and, and uh, you know people from Lucasfilm, and the uh, and the authors, and some people from Del Rey, and we just talked and brainstormed and thought about it, and then the authors did their part, and we did our part, and that's how it happened. Now I mentioned this in the, or I asked this rather, Jet, uh, in the last panel, but. Uh, is it, we, we were talking about the timeline and how far out that you your plan um, with obviously the Force Awakens coming up and we have release dates uh, of some of the subsequent films. Uh, how far out do you have to plan when you're dealing with you know books of this size, complexity, and all of that? Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting because um, you know there really is a long-term plan in place for the entertainment. Um, and story group is very far seeing in that way. Um, we, meaning publishing, we know some of that. Um, we're kind of on a need to know basis as well. So, we <laughs> <laughs> so we definitely work ahead, not quite as far as, as they do. Um, but it definitely comes into play. We know, you know what kind of movies are coming out, um, what kind of TV shows are coming out. Uh, games, etc. And so we do have to plan ahead because we need to, I mean, you know, publishing, just to get into like the boring nuts and bolts, you know, you have a schedule and you have to schedule a certain amount of books per year. And, you know, when you find out that, oh, we're going to have 
two Star Wars movies coming out within six months of each other, you suddenly have to play with the schedule a little bit. Um, so it's definitely always something we're keeping in mind, you know, also just in terms of the kinds of stories we want to tell, um, when in each year there might be, you know, a little bit of a lull entertainment-wise where, you know, that might be a good place that we can introduce something different. Um, for the readers, it takes place, you know, in a, a different, you know, area or time period. Um, so we're definitely looking at it on a global, global scale a few years in the future. Two years. We have another question out there, Pete? Yeah, I'm out here with Justin from Las Vegas, and he has a very interesting continuity question. I was curious how the new books and the new storyline is going to kind of interact with Legacy of the Force and and Fate of the Jedi. They're not. <laughs> Remember, those took place many years after Return of the Jedi, and that the, the movies and everything are recreating that history. So uh, history is now taking a different path, and it can't really interact. It, it, that would be like alternate worlds crossing, which Alan's written about in non-Star Star Wars books. You can read those, and they're very confusing and a lot of fun. <laughs> But it's, it just, it, it, it's not something that we can do with this. Shelly, is it hard to manage the, the, the pipeline? You have uh, books that are obviously being written, you have books that are uh, being published and just hitting the market, you have um, PR going on and you're planning out. Is it hard to keep it all straight? Sometimes. <laughs> all the time? We do our best. <laughs> Another question out there, Pete. Um, you're with Jason, and he's got his next question. So I was wondering, how many copies of Dark Disciple do I have to buy to convince Delray to give us Sword of the Jedi? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. We loved, you know, we worked really hard on our idea for Sword of the Jedi. Um, I'm a Jaina fan. We loved, I'm a big Jaina fan. Um, so, you know, it's, um, I think it was off the Canon panel yesterday, everything's blurring together in my head now, um, you know, talking about, um, you know, stories or characters, um, if we'll ever be able to continue those, um, you know, nothing's impossible, um, you know, we, we know how much you guys love certain characters, we love them too, um, so it's kind of, it's always in the back of our heads, you know, um, so, Right, right now, there's a lot of new stuff, and we're yeah. focusing on new stuff while it's new because that's the nature kind of of life and of, of things moving forward. And I, I mean, in a general life sense, not meaning go to now or then, but um, we can't publish 12 books a year because that would strain everybody's pocketbooks, and people can't read that fast, most people. And kill us. Yes, and I can't do that much work. I guess we will die. <laughs> or Jen and I will kill, kill ourselves. But, um, or each other. Or each other. <laughs> but, um, I, yeah, never say never, but for the time being, j join us on this new journey because it's really, really fun. You know, don't assume that the past is completely dead, but for right now, just do what we're doing and throw, throw yourself into the new opportunities because it's really great. The new books are so good. The new stories we're telling are so good. It's fun to go. Although, I will say, if you want to buy a whole bunch of copies of Dark Disciples, you have a hero's Yeah, I mean, you never know what might happen. Another question? Yeah, we've got David from Woodier, and he has a question for Alan. Hello, Mr. Foster. Uh, great to talk to you. Um, love all your stuff, your original works, your novelizations. My question was whether you're writing about Star Wars, Star Trek, Alien, whatever world you're writing, you capture the voices of the characters, the world so perfectly. How do you do that? You're morphing from each world to the next and you nail it every time. Thank you. When I'm, when I'm writing a novelization, when I'm writing in somebody else's <coughs> universe, uh, as well as my own, I'm a combination of two people. I'm an experienced writer, and I'm a 14-year-old kid sitting in the back of the movie theater with his friends criticizing loudly the lousy special effects. <laughs> you put those two together, and you get what I hope is a real reflection of the film that you're seeing.
want to come closer to the front where I could sit for a second and get two questions in a row where I didn't have to run. So uh, we'll start with uh, this gentleman here. I'm Jay from Baltimore. And um, with the uh, legacy books versus the canon books now, I know I get in a lot of discussions with my friends who know that I read the novelizations and they say, well, why should I focus on the, or it's, or the not legacy legends? Why should I focus on that and not on the new stuff? And I say, well, there's still good stories out there. Is there any chance that I know that the, you know, after Return of the Jedi stuff might conflict with a new movie or movies in some way, but is there any chance for um, other books, uh, for example, Mr. Luceno's um, Darth Plagueis book, to be of the story group, um, and it would kind of, they, they don't really make arbitrary decisions, you know, everything sort of happens organically, um, you know, if, if you read Tarkin, you may have noticed there were some nods and references um, to Jim's previous book in there, um, so we're kind of handling things on case by case, so I can't tell you that it will be, but I can't tell you that it won't be. But we could pretty much guess, unless they change their minds, which is always possible, that if you read it in one of the canon novels, whatever part of that book was referred to, that is canon now. Right, but it doesn't mean the, doesn't whole, mean book the whole book is canon. And you know, the thing about Darth Plagueis is we, you know, the character is canon, and he's mentioned in Revenge of the Sith. So, you know, is Jim's book the way that played out? Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> Next we have Bria from Washington, D.C. Hi, um, I was wondering if you can tell us whether or not The Force Awakens novelization will come out before or after the film, so I know whether or not I have to go to a bunker and hiding. <laughs> okay, the, the novel is, is actually not that easy a question, but it's short, a short answer. The uh, novelization will come out the same day as the movie in, as an e-book. Sorry, guys. As an <laughs> the hardcover will follow at an as yet undecided date in January. Thank you. Don't be long. And it's going to have some cool, cool stuff in it that maybe you didn't see on screen. So it'll totally be worth reading. Jennifer from Sacramento is next up. Yeah, I was wondering with the Shattered Empire comic and um, Aftermath both being after Return of the Jedi, does one take place before the other? Are they concurrent? Are they different characters? Um, the honest answer is I'm not entirely sure yet just because um, the Shattered Empire outline hasn't been totally hammered out yet um, for the simple reason that comics work on a shorter lead time than, than novels. Um, but the plan is definitely to have um, to have them feel like they're taking place around the same time, you know, the same environment, the same state of the galaxy. Um, and we're gonna do what we can to, you know, tie them together a bit. I'm here in the middle of the room now with Tony from LA. How are you? Hi. I just wanted to know, is it gonna be any compilation of the short stories that were published? Maybe. <laughs> There's a lot. We have, we have so many books and so many stories to tell. It's got one thing at a time, and we're, we're, it's it's not not impossible. Yeah, it's, it's definitely not it's definitely not off the table for sure. It's, it's something we that's come up before. And people love the physical copies of the books. I mean, we did all those Lost Tribe of the Sith stories, and we had over a million downloads of those for free. And then we put it out as a book, and it's on the ninth printing. Right. I mean, so <laughs> anything's possible. Are you are you, you you're saying we should do it? I think it's a great idea. I wouldn't sound like a great one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who's next? Jesse from Florida is next up. Hey, so I was wondering, with the upcoming novels, et cetera, et cetera, planning kind of years into the future, you've got that huge base of the legends, canon, locations, characters, events, whatever. Will some of the future novels, are they going to be borrowing things like planets or locations from that, or is everything getting created brand spanking new? Um, I mean, I think some of them already have. They do um, now. They do now. Yeah. It's the same galaxy, huh? Yeah. Um, the, the map is, well, I don't want to say, 
definitively, but the, the novels that have come out have used the same planets and the same species. Yeah, the same and the atlas. Same. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's no re reason to reinvent the wheel when some of this stuff... It, it, if, if our version of it is identical to the way that the previous version was, I would say there's probably no reason to, to, to create something completely new. Yeah, yeah, it's, if, it, and it, again, it's, it's something very much handled on a case-by-case on a -case yeah. basis, um, and it may depend on whether, you know, again, story group may know that a particular planet is going to show up again in five years and something, so, you know, that we may have to stay away from that, but... Um, you know, generally the way it's worked is that if an author wants to use, you know, some element that was created in Legends and there's no reason not to let them do it, then absolutely. I mean, we still, that's still kind of what we fall back on. I mean, that's the tapestry um, that we're working with, so yeah. Who's next? We've got Steve from Minneapolis. Steve, what's your question? So we have all of these comics coming out in the new novels and we have one continuity across all media. Are we going to start to see obvious references between those or so that we know where the comics and novels relate to each other? Are they going to reference each other? Where it's organic, it will, we hope. It is all one story in one, one galaxy. Yeah. Um, I need Jen for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's definitely something we'd like to do. I feel like you probably will see references, um, you know, in the fairly near future. Um, you know, part of that is the, you know, the Marvel stuff just started um, in January, so, um, but both Marvel and Del Rey are very interested in making sure that, you know, everything feels like one universe, so, um, you know, maybe not today, but you'll definitely, you know, see references pop up. For and sure. only where it makes sense. I mean, not, right, we don't need to shoot more with that, but yeah, definitely. Jen, how is it decided what becomes a story that you'll read in a comic book versus a novel versus maybe even an episode of Rebels. And um, do you know of examples where it has shifted, where something was intended for one medium and then it moved to another? Kenobi. Kenobi was a graphic novel. Huh? It was a graphic novel proposal went through three drafts and I realized the thing was too darn long. <laughs> and I put it on the shelf for five years. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, another example I would use is um, the Darth Maul, Son of Dathomir comic that we did. Um, you know, again, that was um, based on Clone Wars episodes that, you know, weren't really going to see the light of day. And we definitely, you know, we had the discussion in-house, would this be better served as a novel or a comic book series? And um, we just felt that, especially with a character like Maul, who's so visual and so physical, um, that a comic book was the best way to go. So yeah, it's definitely you know something that that we consider. Dark Disciple is uh, another obvious example, and I think that was selected for the novel treatment um, as opposed to perhaps another thread from the Cone Wars because it was so character rich and uh, it had a novel gave you the chance to get inside a character's mind, and so it seemed pretty well suited for that medium. Over here in the outer rim, we have Dave from Utah. So I'm probably more the exception than the rule here. I've actually I've never read a Star Wars novel. Oh. You know. <laughs> Thank you, Danny. Are you going to? So my question is, where do you recommend starting? Um, it sounds like obviously within the canon, but at the beginning of the very beginning, somewhere in the middle. Timothy's on. I, th I think you, you can pick what, what interests you the most. Every single one of the books, if you're looking for a novel, every single one of these books right now is, de is, is designed to stand all by itself. It, we really want to, there's a lot of new fans coming in who haven't read the books. I know they're really shocked, but <laughs> some of them didn't know how to read when the books were published, and now they're grown up and they can read them. And, um, and we're, we're trying to reach out, we're trying to make them accessible to people because we did hear a lot of um, people, you know, I, I don't know where to start, there's so many books, I'm overwhelmed. So I would say look at one of the new books and pick an era, that, or an era is kind of too big a word, but um, that interests you, you know, are you interested, do you like the Clone Wars, do you want, do you want an Asajj Ventress uh, yes. <laughs> boss story? Then read Dark, to start with Dark Disciple. Do you, do you love Rebels, do you want to get the feel of Rebels? Then, uh, then, then read A New Dawn. Um, do you love Luke Skywalker? Read Heir to the Jedi. You know, just pick any one of them. They, they, they're neither, none of them are a beginning. Each one is a beginning, and each one is an opening into the greater galaxy. 
and you can start with any of them. So just pick the one that looks interesting to you the most, and then read the others after. Yeah. At, at, the, at the same time, we have um, with the new books coming out, we have put together um, a timeline of the books, the new yeah. canon books Brilliant. that will come out, um, and where they fall in relation to each other, and where they fall in relation to the movies and Rebels. Um, so if you're interested in approaching it from a chronological perspective, you can use that. Yeah, I do. So the books don't follow one from the next. It's not like a series that way, so you don't have to pick a first one. Or you could just like ask the question on Twitter and you'll get like 500 different responses. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. okay. and, and to be clear that the, um, much like in the previous, in the, in the uh, Legends, year one is the Battle of the Island, right? Or year, year zero. Yeah, I believe we're still using that, that designation. Yeah. The benchmark, okay. I think we have time for one more, so make it good. All right, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> Name and where you're from. I'm Michelle from Virginia, and this one is for either John or Shelley. Uh, the Canaan that we see in A New Dawn is very different than the Canaan that we see in <laughs> Rebels. Is there anything kicking around maybe for to fill in that time in between to see how he developed? Maybe. Oh, it's in book as the future is. I don't, I don't think he's that different. I think that they're just a, he's just a younger version. And I think that uh, if there's a story that wants to be told, it'll, it'll be told. Yeah, I mean, Kenan is pretty much in witness protection when we meet him in A New Dawn, and he's getting out of his shell uh, more by the time we get to Rebels. Yeah. But we, you know, we really like the character of Kenan. He's such a rich character, and, you know, you're definitely going to see more exploration of him, you know, either in the novels or the comics or both. How about a hand for this amazing panel?